Merry Christmas. Good, good, good. Man, this is one of my favorite times of year. I'm a little sentimental, and um, I just love lights. I love everything. The only thing I miss about the South is snow. I do love Ohio for snow. That's about it, and only for about a day. And then I want to be back here in the South, you know? But I want to get into just looking at the Christmas story real quick, just a little bit. And, and then God has given me something this month to really help us. And so I'm looking forward to getting that. But just picture with me Joseph and Mary on their way to Bethlehem. Mary is set upon the donkey. Do you think they had a lot of stuff for the journey? Let me ask you that. Probably not a ton. I mean, they're on their way to do their, their recording of their taxes and all the things they're supposed to do. And in and, and my mind, I'm just picturing enough to feed them just to get there, enough clothes for the few days they're going to be there, just very much traveling light. That's just kind of how I, I picture um, Joseph and Mary. And so even in the womb, it seemed as if Jesus at times traveled light, even in the womb. Later on, you see Joseph, Mary, and Jesus fleeing that region to go to Egypt. And in my mind, I still, I picture them traveling light. Even as Jesus is an adult, Jesus said this in his ministry time. He goes, foxes have holes, birds have nests. I don't even have a place to lay my head. Man, as I think about Jesus, I just picture him with his focus and things that he's doing in life um, in such a way that he travels light. And here's something I begin to think about. During the holiday season, it is common for many of us during this time of year to feel extremely weighed down, right? Ugh. How many's got a big old baggage thing that you're carrying at times? Maybe not physically, but in your heart, right? We can feel weighed down. And the holidays can be a time when the pressures and the baggage we carry feel even heavier. It may be that you feel weighed down and burdened by relationships. It might be financial pressure. I, I got to get things squared away because I really need to get my kid this, that he'll have broken and two weeks. And, but I, I need to get it and so we can feel that weighed down by financial pressure. Maybe some of us in here weighed down by regret or weighed down by failure or weighed down by past circumstances and things that you experience and you carry those things into the holidays. And so over the next few weeks, the greatest gift that I believe we can bring to you over the next few weeks is to help you let go some of, some of the things that you're carrying. Amen? Help you kind of lighten that burden and, and that's weighing you down and just kind of help you let go of some of those things. And so this series is designed over the next few weeks to help you the, to like just be able to drop the baggage. Often it's stuff that we're carrying that God never called us to carry anyhow. Isn't that true? And so the goal is that we'll be able to drop some of this baggage, put it down, and be able to get our hands on the more that God has for us. You know, that's what this is about. And really, I, I think of, I can kind of give it to you in a quick, simple, theological, deep. Is it okay if I go theologically deep this morning? Can I do that? All right. The wind is howling like this swirling storm inside. Can we go deep? Amen. Come on, somebody. Couldn't keep it in. Heaven knows I've tried. Don't let them in. Don't let them see. Be the good girl, 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 girl. Okay, some metaphors don't always play out all the way. Be the good girl you always have to be. Conceal, don't feel, don't let them know. Well, now they know. Everybody, let it go. I don't know, sing it, come on, can't hold it back anymore, right? <laughs> let it go, let it go. Turn away and, oh, these are people with children up in here. And slam the, I've heard this, this movie so many times. I don't care what they're going to say. Let the storms rage on. The cold never bother me anyway. Everybody run big one time. Just say, let it go. Yeah. Say it one more time. Let it go. Yeah, yeah that, that's actually the series title for the next three weeks. And I promise you, we won't, we won't Elsa and Anna it every week. But that's the series title is just learning to let things go. 
(laughs) And so what I hope to do over the next few weeks is to remind you and myself that when it comes to this world, this world is not our home. That's how Jesus was able to live in such a way. Obviously, he was Messiah, but he lived in such a way, and he taught his disciples to live in such a way that our thoughts are afar off, but also current. But our burdens, the things we carry, can go to him so that we can carry the burdens of greater things, not lesser things. So we can get our hands on what's really important, what's eternal, not what is temporal. And so as we travel through life, it is amazing how much of the wrong kind of stuff that we end up accumulating. It is. I mean, in this bag, there are hurts. In this bag, there are pains. In this bag, there are seeds of discontentment, seeds of bitterness. And we find ourselves carrying those things. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to start to talk about letting go of some of the stuff that holds us down, weighs us down, holds us back. We're going to look at and see. And the reason why it's so important to look and see at this is this, so that we can really live the life that God would call us to live. Scripture would call it the true life. Amen? So that we can have true life. And so today what we're going to do is we're going to look at letting go of stuff. How many have some stuff in their life? Oh, all of us. Yeah, so that's what we're going to look at today. And the key thought today is this. It's better to have less of what doesn't matter so that you can have more of what does. You only have so much capacity for stuff. You only have so much room to be able to hold on. You only have so much ability to manage things, and so being able to let go of lesser things so that you can hold on to what matters more. The problem is everything in our culture screams the opposite of this. I mean, you can go all the way back to the beginning of time. Adam and Eve, you know, multiply, be fruitful. That sounds awesome. I think Eve was probably a babe, you know. I think Adam was probably fine, you know. And he's like, be fruitful, multiply, multiply. Enjoy each other, enjoy this garden, all the fruit of this garden. Only one thing you can't have is this one tree. That's it, just one thing. Don't touch that. You can have so much, but not that. (laughs) The problem with that is you can go all the way back and see that. And here's the thing. The lie is what you don't have is what you need. (laughs) That's the lie. It's like what you don't have, if I had that, I'd be happy. If I had that, I'd be fulfilled. If I had that, I would be important. If I had that, I would be satisfied. How many iterations of iPhones have you had? The 14 isn't satisfying you. No, I know. It's, it's good, but there'll be a 15. You know, how, I mean, it's just what you don't have. If I had that, I would be happy. That's the, the, the draw with us. That's always wanting more. I mean, we grew up believing this. If, if, if $1 was good, $2 was better. If I can go on one vacation, that's good. Two vacations is better. If one TV is good, five is better, right? If one wife, no, no, stop. <laughs> that's a different TV show right there. You got to pray for my wife, by the way. She loves that sister's wife show. I Just pray for her. I, I, <laughs> That thing's been on, what, like 15 seasons or something like that, and, and she's still captivated by it. She hates herself for it every moment. But just, just pray, just intercede for, for Amy, if you would. So here's that thought again. It's better to have less of what doesn't matter and more of what does. Let me say it slower. It's better to have less of what doesn't matter and more of what does. What I want to call this, I want to call it one handful living. Everybody say one handful living. Pastor, where do you get that? Ecclesiastes 4 verse 6 says in the NIV, it says, Better is one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. That sounds like less, doesn't it? But it sounds like more all at the same time. Well, isn't two better? No, no, this is saying one handful. It's better to have one handful with joy and peace than two handfuls with just craziness and chasing the wind and all the toils. But now I got two handfuls. Isn't that more? Well, what if the stuff you have is robbing you of the life you want? What if? Yeah, two handfuls, but it's chasing the wind. What this says is better is what? Better is what? Better is what? 
Yet one handful is better. That handful with tranquility or with joy, with peace, it's better to have less of what doesn't matter and more of really what does matter. Do you know why? Because your life is valuable. God knows that. Your calling is too great. Your God is too good for you to waste your life on what doesn't matter. Waste your life on the stuff that doesn't last. Waste your life on all the accumulation, and now your hands are so full, and you just want to fill them with even more. In Luke chapter 12, we see a story of Jesus. It's a powerful story. He's talking to two sons, and these two sons are super excited about walking into their inheritance. And in Luke 12, 15, he says, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Another word for covetousness would be greed, desire for more, or an incessant desire for more. Covetousness ties it with the idea of usually more of what others have. That's kind of how it drives us at times to accumulate more. We see things around and we want those as well. We deserve those as well. And the word is strong here. Jesus says to take and care, but he says be on guard. Everybody say be on guard. guard. The intensity of that, be on guard, that sounds like something you would tell somebody like to physically be careful. Like be on, like you're you're military, was it four tours? Five tours, I'm so sorry. No, five, man, praise God. And you're here. And so five tours, you know, be on guard. When a a, a leader would tell you to be on guard, man, you're vigilant. This is physical harm could happen. You've got to pay attention. And that's kind of what's going on here. But it's not physical harm. Jesus was telling them be on guard because he didn't want them to damage their soul. He didn't want them to damage who they really are. And so he's challenging them to be on guard against all kinds of covetousness. Why? Because life, say true life, Yeah, because true life doesn't consist in the abundance of possessions. No, no. But the lie sometimes comes to this thought. It's my life consists of my stuff. And my stuff equals my life. I am because of what I have, and they are one and the same in a sense. And we see that so often in our hobbies. I get that, you know. Um, um, You know, a hunter, you know, he's going to be clad head to toe in camo. 356 or 65 days a year, right? Not always, but a lot of times, you know. We, I, I'm that way, you know. I, you saw me last week. I had my Samba soccer shoes on. Why? Because it was World Cup. My World Cup ended yesterday. And I didn't even get to see it because I was in the woods with my son camping with his trail life troop, and they didn't have, there's no internet out there. So I just got to get home last night about 10 o'clock and turn it on. And whew, so I, but, but those shoes... I had to have those shoes because it's World Cup series season, right? World Cup time. And so, but no, our life does not consist of our stuff. But everything in culture tells you the opposite. You are not what you have. I want you to understand that. You are not what you drive. You are not what you wear. You are not what you own. You are not the stuff that you have. That's a lie. It's the lie that comes to us that says, if you don't have this, you won't be happy. You won't be fulfilled. You won't feel joyful. You won't be cool. You won't fit in. You won't be able to feel good about yourself if you don't have this for your kids. I'm not saying that you shouldn't provide for your kids, but kids are resilient. But if I don't have this for them, I can't feel good as a mama. I can't feel good as a papa. I can't be feeling significant or important if I don't have this. I can't be popular if you're a younger person if I don't have this. So what I'm going to do today is, and it's kind of the perfect time of year, we're going to look at get letting go of some stuff. And it's the perfect time of year because you're about to spend a bunch of money on children to take stuff home, to take it out of the box, and to spend the rest of the day playing with the box. <laughs> it's about what's about to happen, right? My son, Maverick, man, he absolutely loves boxes. Every Amazon thing that comes, he wants mama to open the box, get the stuff out so he can play with the box and do something with it. You know, he's always creating stuff. So what I want to do, I want to ask Matt to give him a water because I'm dying. You see right there, brother? To the right, to the right, to the right. That one, yeah, that one. Thank you. I forgot to carry that up with me. 
I want to give you three things to help you let go. Can we do that today? Three practices of one handful living. That's what we're going to look at. The first thing I want to encourage you to do, because better is one handful, is this. I want you to throw things out. Oh, there are spouses in the room. They're like, whoo, glory to God. <laughs> Preach that, Pastor. Been telling her all these years. <laughs> Preach that. Been telling him all those years, you know. Those tools, you don't even use the tools. Get, you know. <laughs> ah. You're like, you're stepping on toes now. You know. No, I mean, how many dresses? My gosh. All right. <laughs> and most of us have just a crazy amount of stuff. And to be honest, most of us just junk. And <laughs> your life does not consist in the abundance of the junk that you have in your drawer or in your closet or in your attic or in your garage or in your car, glove box, trunk, back seat, or in the storage container you rented because none of those other places was big enough to fit all that stuff. No, no, no. That's not your life. That's a lie. It's not. It really isn't. What are we talking about? Letting go of what doesn't matter so that we can grab a hold of what does. That's what we're talking about here. And, and listen, I'm not talking about decluttering. Okay? I'm not, I'm not talking about just reorganizing. I'm talking about de-owning. De-owning the stuff that at times it can own us. Getting rid of stuff. Stuff because your life doesn't consist of just stuff. Again, Jesus is talking to people. And there's a man, he, he's known as the rich young ruler. And he's really wanting to walk after God. And I like how God is specific to people and their needs and what they need to do to step up into his lordship. Amen, that's important. Do you guys understand lordship? We don't just pray a prayer and get saved and now I don't have to go to hell. Praise God. That's a benefit. That's a great benefit. That's, that's some stuff I want. Like, not going to hell. I, I like that. But lordship is where he is lord, and I am not. He is leader, and I am follower, you know? And this young rich ruler is wanting to follow Jesus, and he's wanting to understand what it takes to inherit the kingdom and walk in the things of the kingdom. And Jesus knows his heart. Jesus knows that this young man loves stuff. Not just that this man had a lot of stuff. He was rich, so he had a lot of stuff. The problem was, this young man, the stuff had him. Not just that he had stuff. And Jesus knew it and loved him enough that he was telling him, you got to let some stuff go, buddy. you got to deal with this. And Jesus tells him, you need to go sell your stuff and then take that money and go give it to the poor. Then you'll have riches in heaven. Then you'll be a follower. Then you'll be doing what is right in the eyes of God. In other words, you'll have less of the stuff that doesn't matter, sir. But you're going to have more of what really does matter what he was telling the rich young ruler the problem was this guy was so into his stuff that the scripture tells us in matthew 19 22 when the young man heard this he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions that sounds like a dichotomy he went away sorrowful for he had wouldn't it be he went away sorrowful because he didn't have he went away sorrowful because he had lack? No, no. He went away sorrowful because he had so much, but he wasn't willing to trade what he had for the more of what God had for him. Yeah, yeah. And again, it's not wrong to have stuff. It's not wrong to have nice stuff. I'm thankful now in my life I have some nicer stuff than I had for the last 25 years. Last five years, I've had a little bit more nicer stuff. I like it. I like having a car that's not breaking down. Come on, somebody. Oh, yeah, but we all were there. We've all been there. We may be some of us there right now. I may go back there. Who knows? It's not wrong to have stuff. God's a generous God. He wants to bless us. It's just he doesn't want stuff to have us. It's wrong when our lives are defined by our stuff. It's wrong when you believe that the more stuff that you actually have, the more you'll be fulfilled or feel happy. If I have more stuff, I'll have more meaning. I'll feel more powerful. If I have more stuff, it'll fill the void that I have in my heart. Just one more thing. One more procurement of something. And now that void goes. No, no, no. The void always needs to be fulfilled or filled by God and the grace of God. By that relationship we have with the Lord, that, that, fills, that fill, fills that gap, that, that void within us. 
So let me ask you, why is it, if that's the case, if we, we get it, that stuff's not supposed to have, it, have us, why is it that we hold on to so much stuff? Why, why can't we give stuff away or throw stuff away? What, what is it? Why? why? There's a couple reasons. The first is fear. I get that, you know, that, that thought that I might need that later. I might need those 15 shirts. I have one back. There's only like seven days in the week. But I may need those, right? Fear. And we're afraid that we might need it in the future. And also, I get it. We don't want to be a waste. We want to be good stewards. I get that. Some of you, the reason why you have fear is because you were raised with a poverty mindset or you were raised actually impoverished. And so there is a fear. I get that. I'm not trying to make you feel bad for that. I get it. Others in the room, it's a fear based in, I pay good money for that. That's mine. Even if I never use it. Even if it sits in the garage for the next 10 years, I might need it, and I pay good money for that, so I can't give that away. I can't throw that away. I can't get rid of it. Here's the thing. What I find is when I struggle holding on to stuff, it's a sign of me having a tremendous lack of faith. When I, when I have to hold on to all this and control and grab all of it, it's a, a challenge to my faith. It's a challenge to my trust because my fear rises up and I might need that again. It's a symbolic act of faith when you give somebody something that is something that you have. It's a symbolic act of faith when you throw something away. Now, obviously, I'm not, I'm, I, 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 that's the big part of me. I hate throwing stuff away because I find value in everything, you know. But you can give stuff away. You can take stuff to, to uh, you know, one of the, um, the thrift places. You, you don't have to just throw things away. Amen? Now, listen, if something's junk, please throw it away. <laughs> like, don't, like, here's some charity. No, that, that's crap. <laughs> Keep your own crap. Don't give crap away. <laughs> oh, man, I should have said that. <laughs> just being generous. No, no, you're just saving money from going to the dump. Uh, no but when you do give away and when you do throw things away it's like you're trusting God you're saying I I know he will provide for me in the future I know he's going to take care of me I understand I I get that I'm 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 going to bless someone else today because I know he'll bless me again next month or two when I have that need I can trust God is what it's saying that's the first is we have fear and we don't trust the second reason why we hold on to things is sentiment How many sentimental folk? I am ridiculously sentimental. Do you know I have the long sleeve shirt that I was wearing, the jersey, when I broke my shoulder at 29 years old, dirt biking? Why? (laughs) Because that's the day of my life. I mean, like, my arm doesn't work from that day forward. It's important. Do you know I have the shirt I wore the day we launched Momentum Church at the movie theater? And actually, (laughs) it's almost back in style. It really is. No, I'm serious. I'm serious. That's serious. That's, that'll be that's 17 years ago in January. I mean, like, yeah, it's, it's per, per near back. It's almost. I might, a couple more years, you'll see me wearing that green shirt and stripes. If I wear it, you know, you'll know. But, but sentiment. I, I, have you ever done any reading or watching stuff about minimalism? Oh, it's, it's cool. I would love to be a minimalist. I struggle. I'm preaching to myself on this sermon. I really am. Like some of these minimalists will live their life with only 100 items. To their name, a hundred items. That's crazy. Like you have a toothbrush to brush your teeth, that's an item. Toothpaste to go with a toothbrush, you got 98 more, baby. That's it. <laughs> have you guys heard of Marie Kondo? <laughs> She's a freak. <laughs> In her book, The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up, she says some things about sentimental things. She says if you have something sentimental, you know, you, you say thank you. And you think about the person, oh, you're loving this, Stephanie, or uh, Stacy's like, oh, preach. You, you say thank you, and you think about the person that gave that to you, and you thank them, and you're appreciative, you know, and then you throw it away. <laughs> you know? And that's that. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> I struggle with this one. 
Amy knows, like, I have my little keepsake. I, I've got my wrestling jacket, my letterman jacket from school, my soccer and wrestling jacket. Why? Well, one of the kids might want. No, they don't. <laughs> and there's seasons where I do get rid of stuff. I got stuff down to about a box now. But there was, I mean, there was a, probably 20 years where I kept every trophy I had, all this stuff. You know, I wanted people to know, yes, this year I had, I, I don't know, it sounds silly, this year I got MVP for right halfback or right midfield. The next year, center midfield. And the next year, MVP for left midfield. I'm a right footer, but I'm not anymore. Because I had an Irish coach. Ross, dang it, you're your left foot, Ross. <laughs> Don't you know? And so, basically, I was proud of that because it showed that I was MVP in three positions in three years in school as I learned to become dominant in my left foot. And I was. I was pretty dominant in my left foot has nothing to do with anybody. My kids don't want it. I threw those away probably 15 years ago. But they came to Georgia with me. Like, why? Because you can't get rid of stuff. It's sentiment. You know, that was a, a thing of my pride. <laughs> so we have to remind ourselves <laughs> what we want is less of the stuff that doesn't matter so that we can have more of what really does. Amen? Better is one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and chasing the wind. I'm going to keep driving that home. So that's the first thing we have to do. If we want one handful living, we got to throw some stuff or give some stuff away. Okay? Things that you actually have. Go on. How many will commit with me this week? There'll be some stuff you'll get rid of. Amen. Not your wife's stuff. Your stuff. Okay? All right. And I'm going to commit too, I promise. You can catch me in the hall next week and ask me, what did you get rid of? Don't ask for that jersey. And don't ask for that shirt from the first day of the church. But, but I'll get rid of some stuff, I promise you. I'm with you. Second thing, if we're going to have one full handful of living, one handful of living, we've got to buy less. Do you realize during Black Friday and Cyber Monday, actually the five days over that long weekend to, to, from Friday to Tuesday, 34 point no, 35, when you're talking about billions, one billion is a lot, so let's get it right. $35.4 billion was spent in our country. Oh, it's a record. Isn't that nuts? And what's crazy is, if you were to poll people, they say this statistically, 62% of people will actually admit that they'll go shopping to cheer themselves up. You know, it's tied to that. I feel down, I feel depressed, so guess what? I'm going to go shopping, I'm going to get more financially in debt, and that way I'll feel so much better. <laughs> it's a form of cruel entertainment is what it is. I want something new, I want something clean. When I go shopping, maybe it's, I, I, it makes me feel powerful, it makes me feel some momentary significance or joy. There's something about shopping that literally gives you a dopamine high. And you know I'm big on that. We've talked about that for the last three or four months, how the enemy uses our own chemistry to rob us. You get that dopamine high. And now I just, mm, I need something more. Psalms 119 would call it an illusion in one translation. This translation just says that our eyes aren't to look at worthless things. In Psalms 119, 36 through 37, it says, Incline my heart to your testimonies or to your word and to not selfish gain. Turn my eyes from looking at illusions, or in this translation, looking at worthless things or meaningless things, and give me life in your ways. Do you hear that? Give me life. That's true life. What I want to do is be able to get myself to the place where my eyes aren't on the worthless things, but are on the things that have meaning, and get my eyes on the things that are truly full of the goodness of God. I don't need to keep accumulating in order to feel better about myself or better about my situation. I don't need to keep accumulating to feel as if I can be now defined because I have this or I have that. No, no, I don't have to do all that because Jesus has defined me. You don't have to do all that because Jesus has defined you. And so buy less, say buy less. I'll tell you one thing Amy and I have been trying to do the last few years is we've been trying to buy less when it comes to our family when it comes to our children. And instead of buying, we're trying to do, we're choosing experiences over things, you know? Like, like doing instead of buying, memories instead of stuff. I want my children to enjoy and have great memories over those things. And you know, when we were growing up, like with our first set of kids, you know, if you don't know, I have three older children, over 20, up to tw almost 26, and then I have two little ones, 11 and seven. And with our first three, you know, 
it, it was one of those things where we just didn't have a lot. And I wondered if we didn't give them a good upbringing, you know? Guys, there's not a week goes by that they're not finding some old Facebook memory or some chap snap <laughs> thing, and they, like, send it to us. And it's stuff that they did. It's experiences. It's silly stuff in the living room that didn't cost us a dime. But guess what? That's the stuff that they value and remember still to the day, to this day. Not because we were able to give them a ton of stuff, because we couldn't. I can remember our kids going to um, the school they went to and, 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 and basically going to people's homes that were like really nice houses. And, and you know, driving up like, oh, we don't have anything like this, you yeah. know. But kids never talked about it. They, t- they talked about, talk about the memories and the things that we did do. Experiences, not stuff. Yeah. And so throw out stuff. Don't be weighed down by stuff. That's one side. But then on the other side of that, stu- that, that oh, yeah, on the other side of that, there's a freedom and there's a joy when you begin to spend less finances on things and begin to apply those things on building relationships and on memories. Ever say buy less. Not one more purchase is going to make you feel any better, at least long term. But man, when those kids and your family have those memories, that feels good for a lifetime. And then the final thing is give more. Give more. Oh, I knew this was coming. Yes, you should know this is coming. We're Christians. We should be the most generous people on the planet. Amen. There, there ought to be that thought that, man, there's an opportunity to give and, and bless. Man, I'm excited about that, you know. Here's what it says in 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19. And again, this is all about one handful living, okay? Command those who are rich in this present world. This is Paul speaking to Timothy, telling him to preach this to the people he's serving. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, which, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment, Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. And in this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. There's that true life, that truly light living. And you may look at that and say, okay, command the rich. Ross, I know some rich people, but I'm certainly not rich. I grew up with some rich people, but I'm not rich. I know what it looks like to be rich, but that's not me. Ross, I'm still paying college debt, and it's been years and years and years. I'm not rich. Let me give you a global perspective for a moment when it comes to rich. If you drove your car here today, you are rich, all right? Literally, if you drove here today, you are somewhere between the top 5 to 7% of the richest people in the whole planet, just shy of 8 billion people. If you had three meals, how many is planning to have three meals today? You're like, Ross, I had three meals before lunch, you know? <laughs> if you had three meals, or at least the option to have three meals, you're in the top 40%. Isn't that crazy? Of people alive today. I heard today that, that you know, $35.4 billion, it only takes $10 billion to eradicate the whole world's need for, for water. And the number one reason why people die around the world is lack of water. One of the number one reasons is, is poor water conditions that bring sickness. Just, just one five-day period and just one-fourth of that almost. And that would have done it. Yeah. That's one of those things. It's more. I'd rather have more of what matters than to hold on to those things that are less. And we shouldn't feel guilty if we have nice stuff. We shouldn't just let that stuff have us. That's the thing. So Paul commands, Timothy says, command those who are rich. And now notice, he didn't say command them to buy more. Command those who are rich, buy more. He didn't do that. He didn't say, Timothy, command those who are rich, hoard more. He didn't say that. No, no, no. No. He, He doesn't command them. Timothy, tell them, click on Prime, Amazon Prime more. No, no, he doesn't say that. He says, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. Let me say it this way. Your life does not consist in the abundance of stuff. No, no. Man, your life, true living, comes when we live in such a way that we live with one hand full of what God has and the other hand offering it out to others. 
one handful living. You know, I can tell you this. I have no emotional stories when it comes in my life about getting. I mean, yeah, there's neat things I've got, but they're not like deep driving emotional stories, you know. I, I don't have super emotional stories about keeping. But man, I got some amazing, meaningful, emotional stories about sacrificial giving. Like when I didn't have finances and I still tithed anyhow and I saw how God came through. Amazing memories about God's faithfulness, you know. Man, you get an extra refrigerator. It's so meaningful that I put that refrigerator in my garage and I filled it with stuff I haven't seen in a year and a half. It means so much, right? No, no. It meant so much. I had this extra refrigerator, and there was this woman I heard at small group, and she has a need, and she's a single mom, and I gave her that extra refrigerator. And man, that family has food. They don't have to worry about keep putting ice in an ice chest, and, and that's a blessing. See the memories? Yeah. Mm. But you know, all of you, if you begin to think about it, your emotional, your emotional memories really will tie around. You're giving more than you're getting, and that's what matters. Yes, it does. And so it goes on. I'm going to finish with this. Be rich in good deeds. Be generous, willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so they may take hold of a life that is true life. Better is one handful with tranquility, with contentment, with peace, with joy, with simplicity, with margin, with assurance, with confidence, with the ability to be generous, with the heart to be a blessing, than two handfuls with toil, pain, struggle, just to get more stuff, more stuff, more stuff. Chasing after the wind. No, no, no. Less of what doesn't matter and more of what does. That should be our goal. And the reason why the scripture says it, because we're laying up a different treasure. This world's not our home. And we should ask ourselves, are we accumulating on earth what we cannot keep? Or are we investing in heaven what we cannot lose? One handful of living, one handful of living will allow you to begin to invest in heaven. And so it'll allow you to let it go, let it go. Amen? Everybody say, let it go. You you know why one handful living is so important too? Is that when it comes to one handful living, it gives you a free hand. I already said a free hand to give, but when you have that one handful living and you're living that way and there's somebody who has some need and you're like, man, time. I'm holding on to my time. No, no, you know what? One handful living when it comes to my agenda, time. You know what? I need to help this person. And you have one hand to reach out and help somebody out. Amen? Amen. One handful living will change everything. That's why God really gets us in the area of the finances. Because I think he knows when it comes to us and matters of stuff, if he can own the stuff and the stuff doesn't own us, then he can own our agenda. (laughs) He can own our generosity. He can own the expression of who we are, who he is in the earth through us. Amen? He could be Lord. So I want to challenge you. What are you going to throw or give away? What are you going to buy less? Something that you wanted to buy, and you're like, you know what? I'm not buying that. I was going to, but I'm not. Think about that this week. And then that final thing, what are you going to give? 